Calvinism and Evangelism. If grace is truly irresistible, if only those elected by God to salvation can be saved, if no one can believe the gospel until regenerated by God and thereafter given the faith to believe, would it not be vain to attempt to persuade anyone to embrace the gospel, or for those who hear it to voluntarily believe in Christ? Since there is nothing one can do to change one's eternal destiny, if among the elect nothing can keep one out of heaven, if not, nothing can be done to escape hell, shouldn't one just let the inevitable take its course? Although many Calvinists would object to this view, inevitably this is the practical conclusion to which that fatalistic dogma leads. After all, they say, Regeneration takes place sovereignly, without any faith on the part of the recipient, or even knowledge of its occurrence. Yet Calvinists, like Spurgeon, often contradict themselves out of a sincere concern for souls that conflicts with Tulip. At times, D. James Kennedy, founder of Evangelism Explosion, makes it sound as though salvation is available to all, and even that faith precedes regeneration. Place your trust in Christ, he says. Ask him to come in and to be born in you today. Likewise, contrary to his professed Calvinism, Spurgeon taught that soul winning is the chief business of the Christian. But soul winning is an oxymoron if Calvinism is true. The eternal destiny of every person has already been predetermined, so winning is impossible. Yet Kennedy trains others to evangelize, and in the process further contradicts Calvinism. For if it is true that we must be born again, then it is also true that we may be born again. That, my friends, is the good news. Does he seriously mean that salvation for the elect alone is good news for everyone? Doesn't such language mock the non-elect? In attempting to show that evangelism has some place in Calvinism, Bertner declared that every preacher should pray for them to whom he presents the gospel, that they may each be among the elect. But since the number and identity of the elect is already determined, isn't such a prayer in vain? Indeed, what is the point of either praying or preaching, if it is not the gospel, but sovereign regeneration that brings men to Christ, and the fate of each has been predestined from a past eternity? As for Kennedy's good news, are those who have been predestined to eternal torment expected to rejoice that their doom is sealed, and there is nothing that can be done to change it? Can he and other evangelistically inclined Calvinists seriously think their practice matches their belief? In disagreeing with Hoxmar, another Calvinist rightly points out that for them, the elect alone, the gospel is good news. Many Calvinists are convinced, and logically so, that the doctrines of grace are contrary to soul winning. Engelsmar callously declares that the call of the gospel does not express God's love for them, the non-elect, nor is it a saving purpose. On the contrary, it is his purpose to render them inexcusable and to harden them. No wonder that, by their own admission, so many Calvinists lack the Apostle Paul's zeal for winning the lost. Vance quotes a sovereign grace Baptist leader who admits that our preachers are not soul-winning men. We do not have soul-winning members. We almost never give any instructions on why and how to win souls. We do not really work at soul-winning in our churches. But this is Calvinism. Why work at soul-winning? There is no winning those whose eternal destiny has already been decided. Sproul insists, Those whom the Father regenerates come to Christ. Without regeneration, no one will ever come to Christ. With regeneration, no one will ever reject him. Evangelism, then, has little significance. James E. Adams declares, Repentance and faith are the acts of regenerated men, not of men dead in sins. Contradicting his quote above, 
Bertner says, Only those who are quickened, made spiritually alive by the Holy Spirit, ever have that will to come to Christ. We have already asked, If God is able to regenerate totally depraved sinners, why couldn't He cause the elect to live perfect lives after He has regenerated them? Why doesn't God's irresistible grace that is so powerful towards sinners create perfect obedience after they are saved? Why is grace irresistible for lost sinners, bending their wills to His, but not for saved sinners, who so often fail to do His will? Something is wrong with this theory.